Welcome back to New Rockstars. I'm Eric Boss, and this is a breakdown of Black Panther Wakanda Forever, a film that teaches us how in grief there is power. In a truly remarkable feat of cinema to advance the thematically rich thought experiment of Wakanda, somehow without its beloved hero T'Challa, the late Chadwick Boseman. We must dive deep into this film to celebrate how director Ryan Coogler pulled this off, breaking it down scene by scene, not just for the Marvel Easter eggs, but really for what I consider to be even more rewarding and easier to overlook filmmaking choices. But quickly, just want to thank the sponsor of this video. Inkbox. Spoiler warning if you have not seen the film yet. Over Black, we hear the voice of Shuri praying, Bost, please allow me to heal my brother. Now, of course, Bost is a panther deity of Wakanda, the entity that endows the Black Panther with their powers. She prays because she needs to regrow the heart-shaped herb, all of which was burned by Killmonger in the 2018 film, and Bost is believed to be the spiritual source of that herb. Shuri scrambles in her lab to heal T'Challa by regrowing this herb synthetically with her AI, Griot, voiced by Trevor Noah. It's a gripping 90-second long take, no cutting, documentary style underscoring this as a true medical emergency. Now, the herb's DNA is shown in a double helix configuration with white orbs. While the 2018 film opened with grains of black, this is orbs of white, already cast in the Wakandan color of mourning. Griot reports the DNA's confidence rate is 25%, then 29%. Shuri says good enough and orders it 3D printed, but her mother Ramonda enters to report, your brother is with the ancestors. Now, T'Challa's illness is never specified in this film, out of respect to the late Chadwick Boseman, whose death in August 2020 after a private battle with colon cancer prompted a rewrite of the script. This way, Ryan Coogler and co-writer Joe Robert Cole avoid exploiting Boseman's death as a plot point or a spectacle because it's not really about how T'Challa died, it's about how to mourn. And so by using simply the word illness, they imply it wasn't some cosmic MCU battle, but really a more grounded way that many of us have lost our loved ones, and truly the way that we lost Chadwick. Shuri is our focal character for this story, and this movie evolves her as comic relief kid sister to a true instrument of grief, who, through her journey, teaches us how to heal ourselves. Because while she's really trying to heal her brother in the opening minutes, her true mission of this film is to heal herself. Like the proverb, physician, heal thyself. Shuri's wounds will only be treated when she takes the remedy that she's trying to produce for her brother, and once she properly grieves her lost family, Bast answers her prayers with T'Challa's legacy. T'Challa is buried in a private family plot as water is poured in soil, hydrating this plot where Shuri will later plant future heart-shaped herbs. Shapoy the shaman, successor to spiritual elder Zuri in the 2018 film, enters T'Challa as the son of T'Chaka and the descendant of Bashenga, the first Black Panther, and while it's all in Wakandan, the term Black Panther is in English, suggesting that, like Namor, this is a name given to the hero by the outsiders of this world. While T'Challa himself is buried here, his ceremonial casket is paraded through the streets of the Golden City of Wakanda, a festive celebration of life. Shuri, Ramonda, and all the Wakandans wear the color white, as they did while they were mourning T'Chaka in the 2018 film. We pass a naval guard playing a water drum, which is a cameo by Jabari Exum, a drumming and movement coach from the 2018 film and a friend of Chadwick Boseman's, whom Lupita Nyong'o said would drum while they did their fight training for this movie became a very important part of their rhythm, one way that they try to keep Chadwick's spirit fighting alongside them in this movie. A tribute billboard with Wakanda lettering translates to, the Panther King forever lives in us and rests with the ancestors. Overhead, Wakanda jets crisscross in a flyover, leaving exhaust trails that are crossed like the Wakandan chess salute. The Royal Cemetery Gate is flanked by statues of Bashenga on one side and a female on the other, both of whom have Panther statues at their feet. The female could be Bashenga's wife or his sister. Either way, both T'Challa's sister and his wife play key roles in furthering his legacy. As they salute his casket and it rises up into the jet, the music is Ludwig Göransson's ancestral plane theme, to me the most powerful melody from his Oscar-winning score. It's the music T'Challa heard when he entered the ancestral plane to join his ancestors in the 2018 film, and it's the music he and we hear now. And then, under reverent silence, the Marvel Studios fanfare replaces typical imagery of Avengers with moments and script quotes from Chadwick Boseman as T'Challa. First, the script quote from Civil War when he told Natasha about the green field with Boston Segment after his father died. Then our very first shot of Chadwick in the MCU when he looked over his shoulder when he was in Vienna in Civil War. Then T'Challa in a suit with his mask off. Then the script quote, T'Challa asks his father in the ancestral plane, tell me how to best protect Wakanda, I want to be a great king. Then the script quote, T'Challa said before the UN, in times of crisis, the wise build bridges while the foolish build barriers. Then an image of Black Panther with the mask on. Then the script quote, what happens now determines what happens to the rest of the world, which I think was just a line from the Black Panther trailer marketing throughout 2017 and 2018. Then the script quote, if anyone found out what we truly are and what we possess, they could destroy the world, it's my duty to protect it, which is an alternate line from the movie that T'Challa said to Nakia when they walked through the streets in Black Panther. 
and then T'Challa crossing his arms in salute. Then we see the letters of Marvel Studios where the flickering images are more famous moments of T'Challa. T'Challa walking into Shuri's lab in the 2018 film, T'Challa celebrating at Warrior Falls after he defeated M'Baku, T'Challa hugging his father T'Chaka in the ancestral plane in the 2018 film, the moment T'Challa drops out of the Royal Talon Fighter to help Nakia in the 2018 film, then on the inside of the V, T'Challa swinging from the rhino horn in the Battle of the 2018 film, then on the R, T'Challa and Shuri stepping out of the portal in Endgame to give Cap some backup, and then on the M, T'Challa shouting the words, Wakanda forever in Infinity War right before the charge. And it ends as it has throughout many Phase 4 titles, clearing all of these images with T'Challa punching the ground to release a shockwave. And behind all of this is a purple hue, the color of the heart-shaped herb. Fitting, beautiful, and poignant tribute. We transition one year later. Queen Ramonda, played by Angela Bassett, and a powerful, truly Oscar-worthy performance addresses the UN, who tries to shame her for not sharing Wakandan vibranium with the outside world. Richard Schiff, Toby Ziegler from the West Wing, is credited as the U.S. Secretary of State, an office which, during the Civil War era, was held by Thaddeus Ross in the MCU. R.I.P. to Thunderbolt Ross, William Hurt, as well as leader of the Merchant Tribe, Dorothy Steele, who plays a small role in this movie, but also died during production. The French Secretary of State reminds us that vibranium cannot be detected by known metal detectors, as we saw in the 2018 film when T'Challa, Nakia, and Okoye entered that Korean nightclub. Ramona defends the Wakandans actions as safeguards against the hostility of other nations, saying she knows they whispered the king is dead, the Black Panther is gone, and now is the time to strike, calling out their treacherous betrayals of their goodwill the last time Wakanda appeared before the UN. And we actually see these actions at a Wakandan outreach center in Onsongo, Mali, one of the many outreach centers T'Challa and Shuri opened around the world, including one in Oakland that we saw at the end of the 2018 film. French commandos attack these scientists, but Okoye leads the Dormelage to the rescue, and we find out that one of these scientists is actually one of the Dormelage undercover, Aneka, played by Michaela Cole. She uses vibration daggers against Okoye's insistence that she use a spear. The fact that the Dormelage already had to have someone here suggests that they must have anticipated this attack and or other outreach centers have already been raided. And we learn, in a twist, this attack had already happened hours before the UN speech. So the Dormelage escort these commandos to the UN to shame the French. Je vous en prie. Let our gracious response to this incursion be an olive branch. Yeah, Okoye's French and other non-English languages in this movie is translated into subtitles the color white, Wakandan is always translated into yellow, and the language of Talokan is translated into blue. And of course, it's hard to hear the word incursion in the MCU and not think of Reed Richards warning us about incursions heading to secret wars and multiverse madness. We should note that in the 2015 John Hickman New Avengers run that kicks off that Illuminati freakout over incursions that seems to be Marvel Studios' roadmap for how we're leading to that, the initial incursion point appears where? Over the skies over Wakanda. Then onto an ocean expedition where a team of dive is using a one-of-a-kind vibranium detector to investigate an underwater drill that got busted on a deposit of vibranium. They're led by Dr. Graham, actress Lake Bell, who voices Natasha Romanoff on What If. The Telecon warriors dart past them in the shadows, and we hear louder and louder their siren song. The divers Salazar and Jackson get transfixed by a phantom jellyfish before the Teleconians kill them. I gotta imagine this was at least a nod from Kugler to Jordan Peele for the jellyfish-inspired UFO jean jacket and nope, which hypnotically led people to their doom. But we gotta note, in this movie, not that kind of doom. The Teleconians break the surface of the water and sing, hypnotizing crew members to walk off the deck into the water. This is based on sirens of Greek mythology, humanoid creatures who would lure sailors to their shores with their songs, but then cause those sailors to crash on the rocks of the islands. Atuma, Namora, and other Telegonians board the ship and attack. In the comics, Atuma is a rival to Namor, but here he's kind of his second in command. They all wear breathing masks filled with water so that they can move on land, similar to the moisture masks of the still suits in Dune. Dr. Graham departs in a helicopter, but it crashes, revealed to have been thrown by its tail by Namor flying with his ankle wings. And we cross dissolve from this into the border of Wakanda, making it look like Namor is flying into that kingdom as this will be the next place he visits. CNN's Anderson Cooper cameos reporting on the UN speech. If you look closely at the ticker along the bottom of the screen, it reads, Scott Lang continues to promote his book, Look Out for the Little Guy. That book is Ant-Man's autobiography that he promotes in Ant-Man the Wasp Quantumania, which of course is the next film on Marvel Studios' slate. Ramonda finds Shuri in the lab where Shuri is designing the exo suits that will eventually become Okoye's Midnight Angel suits. The Wakandan letters on Shuri screen translate to flat line, which might just be one of her design template tool options, but also might just be an unfortunate word combination, reminding her of how a year earlier she found out her brother flatlined in the same spot. Now, Ramona says that the AI griot unnerves her, saying one day artificial intelligence is going to kill us all, and Shuri says AI isn't like the movie's mother, it does exactly what I tell it to, which is a pretty odd exchange for a world that has definitely had to deal with Ultron, but Ramona tells Shuri she wants to take her on a trip, telling her to leave behind her Kamoyo bead bracelet and her Kamoyo earrings, setting up Shuri to have two 
two separate ways of tracking her after she leaves behind her bracelet on the bridge. Ramona takes Shuri to a riverside campfire to partake in a mourning ritual of burning the funeral garments. Nearby, elephants bathe in the river. Elephants are known to have complex grieving rituals as well, traveling long distances to the sites on the anniversaries of the deaths of family members, guided by an instinct similar to the hand of T'Challa's spirit that Ramonda mentions here. But Shuri, always a scientist, is a skeptic. She says the hand was a construct of Ramonda's mind. Shuri says, if I sit here and think about my brother for too long, it won't be these clothes I burn, it will be the world and everyone in it. Now later, when Shuri enters the ancestral plane, she wears these funeral garments as the room around her catches fire. So in this moment, when she talks about burning the world, she is invoking Killmonger and his rage. Ramonda nearly tells Shuri a secret about T'Challa. They are interrupted by Namor. Now in the comics, Namor was a Samariner, ruler of Atlantis, Marvel's first mutant when he was introduced in Timely Comics 1939. But here, the character has been reconceived by Ryan Coogler to be played by Tenoch Huerta from the realm of Talokan, but still having the pointy ears and the ankle wings. Namor says, This place is amazing. The air is pristine. And the water. My mother told stories about a place like this. A protected land with people that never have to leave. That never have to change who they were. What reason do you have to reveal your secret to the world? I am not a woman who enjoys repeating herself. Who are you? I have many names. My people call me Ahkukunkan. But my enemies call me Namor. Kukul Khan is the feathered serpent deity worshipped by the ancient Mayans. Talo Khan is based on Tlalo Khan, an Aztec afterlife that takes in those who die from drowning or anything associated with rain or water. The native language spoken by the Talo Khanil, according to Tenoch Huerta, is based on ancient Mayan languages. Shuri observes that Namor is covered in vibranium, meaning that she can just kind of eyeball his metallic chest pieces and pearls and tell that they are all vibranium, despite their different color and texture from the vibranium she works with. She's such an expert, she just knows vibranium when she sees it. Namor leaves Ramonda with the American vibranium detector and a vibranium conch shell to call him. And I just love this detail because it embraces what I was told as a Florida kid that when you put a shell up to your ear, you can hear the ocean. Nope really here in Namor. The Council of Elders gathers, including M'Baku of the Mountain Tribe, the Elders of the River Tribe, Mining Tribe, Border Tribe, and Merchant Tribe. As M'Baku enters this room, he eats a veggie, a callback to his line in the 2018 film. One more word, and I will feed you to my children. I'm kidding, we have vegetarians. The Dormelage stand on columns for the different parts of the kingdom. On the columns are written Golden City, King's Guard, River Tribe, Mining Tribe. Behind each guard are the tableau symbols in red clay, just like the floor of this throne room. They originally designed this throne room to be made of the same clay so that all the different rulers of the different tribes would all stand on the same terrain. One of these symbols is a large tree with expansive branches and equally expansive roots. In the past, I've compared this to the Idrisil World's Tree of Asgardian mythology, but in this case, I like the symbolism of as above so below. As above, we have the kingdom of Wakanda. As below, we have the kingdom of Talo Khan. Now, behind each Dormelage guard, some new text has been added to the throne room. The full transcription is, Rest in power, King T'Challa, our hero, t'was an honor, Wakanda forever. Ramonda sits upon the throne, and on the seat of it, the Wakandan translates to wisdom and loyalty. Actor Isaac Debenkele plays the River Tribe Elder, as he did in the 2018 film, and surmises that Namor must have swum, he says, 100 kilometers to bypass the river border. Makes us wonder a bit about the Wakanda geography because it is certainly more than 100 kilometers to the nearest ocean or sea based on the map of Wakanda from Civil War, but it would be within 100 kilometers of Lake Victoria, which would be a nearby lake that Namor could swim to up the Nile for the Mediterranean Sea. I have broken down this geography in other videos, but I think the math does check out there. Ramonda Shuri and Okoye deduce that there must have been a second vibranium meteorite that landed in the ocean, which means for them, the one gift from the heavens that made Wakanda unique, a vibranium meteorite, was also a gift that the cosmos gave to the ocean of Earth. But it also poses the question, where in the cosmos most did all these chunks of vibranium come from? I look forward to exploring that and many of the other questions from this movie in future videos. But Everett Ross returns to the 2018 film and tells Shuri and Okoye that the scientist is an MIT student, so they head to MIT. And remember, this is Tony Stark's alma mater and currently the college attended by MJ, Ned, and Flash. Shuri and Okoye spy on Riri Williams, played by Dominique Thorne, future Ironheart. Thor actually initially auditioned for the role of Shuri for the 2018 film, and you can tell there's an inherent sisterhood between the two women as intellectual equals, kind of like what we initially saw between Tony Stark and Peter Parker in Civil War. On Shuri dorm room door is a note, Colat's conjecture 300 plus one. This refers to the 3x plus one problem of the Colat's conjecture that's the most famous unsolved problem in mathematics. Presumably this is what Riri is actively working on in her spare time. Inside Riri's room is a flag of the city of Chicago that is her hometown and Okoye gets impatient. Get out of my dorm, get out. Hey, I'm warning you do not take another Ooh. step toward me. 
see how they teach the children to treat their guests. Mm. Oh. Put a spear in here. Who brought a spear in here? I like her. Hey, 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 hey. Put it down, put it. You hurt yourself. Come on. It's all right, princess. Small, small girl. I am going to give you two options. You can come to Wakanda, conscious or unconscious. Yeah, remember in the 2018 film, Okoye used an itchy wig to go undercover in the outside world in Korea. Now she just covers her head tattoos with makeup, but it presents its own complication. They go to Riri's warehouse, where she said she had to build a quantum computer to crack her own encryption. Quantum, you say? I mean, the future of technology in the MCU is certainly quantum. Riri actually could have been the friend who helped Cassie Lang build that quantum tech that leads to all of them getting sucked into the quantum realm and quantum mania. Quantum, 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 quantum. Shuri notices Riri blueprints asking if it's, quote, Stark tech. So it's not just that Shuri is building her own exosuit inspired by Iron Man, she is actually using Stark Tech schematics. Meaning she might be building this with Tony's blessing through one of those MIT grants, like the one that he announced in Civil War. Tony's speech at MIT would have been like eight years before this, but I assume the grant program is still functioning. Riri says, there's an entire YouTube channel dedicated to sightings of me, which is another Peter Parker parallel with Civil War and Homecoming showing YouTube videos of Peter's heroics throughout Queens. This might also be an account you could imagine Kamala Khan having something to do with, either posting content there or definitely replying to it. Okoye takes off in a muscle car, Shuri on a motorcycle, and Riri suits up in her Mark I armor. When it powers up, notice it makes the same sound effect as Tony Stark's repulsors. Honestly, this is my favorite suit of all the suits that Riri wears in this film. The other one looks a little gun to me to me. But here, there's no full coverage of the body. It's really just like bars and straps and rigging and zip ties. And she has this chest reactor in the shape of a heart. The whole escape is just very reminiscent of Tony Stark's initial escape from the cave in his unfinished Mark I suit in the first Iron Man film. Riri makes this rapid climb into the night sky, but she runs out of oxygen and falls, reminding us a lot of Tony's first real flight over Los Angeles when he froze over and fell and just caught himself at the last second. Riri catches herself here and glides along the river. Shuri and Okoye flee the FBI. Shuri uses her spear to anchor her turn. A government drone closes in on them, but Riri shoots it down and joins the other two in a victorious glide over the wreckage until, boom, you looking for this? A water grenade completely wrecks them. And Atuma and Namora and friends join them on the bridge, jumping for the back of a freaking whale. The actors actually said this duel between Okoye and Atuma took the longest of any fight sequence in the film to shoot as they kept having to go back and reshoot parts of it. I love how Atuma's strike slides Okoye back on her feet. She has a vibrating spear and she is not used to ever having to repel other vibranium with it. So defeated, Shuri requests that Tala Kanil take her and Riri to meet Namor directly. The next morning, Everett Ross arrives at this crime scene where he meets Valentina Allegra de Fontaine, Julie Louis Dreyfus, the shadowy government figure from the Falcon and the Winter Soldier and Black Widow, who is now established as of this film as the current CIA director in the MCU and Ross's ex-wife. This is a huge deal for the political hierarchy of the MCU. This is what I was referring to in my tweet when I said that the hierarchy of power of the MCU was changing and I said, Ollie, you're gonna get mad at me when you find out what it was. But yeah, I think it's extremely significant. Now, we don't know how long Val has been the CIA director because John Walker didn't really seem to know who she was. And the CIA director is a president nominated and Senate approved, very public figure. While the average person might not know who the CIA director is, someone like John Walker would know. But either way, this means that Val's recruitment of Walker and recruitment of Yelena Belova to kill Hawkeye, all of these things have the full weight of the US government behind it. And now, since Val is going to be leading the Thunderbolts, the Thunderbolts is going to be a much more public squad of killers. I think this is definitely gonna tie into Secret Invasion and Captain America New World Order and yeah, Thunderbolts. And Val just shot to the top of my list as Skrull Spicious and Everett Ross right behind her. Okoye reports losing Shuri and Riri. The doorways behind her are now flanked with text. On sacred ground may we find, and on the other side, the wisdom of the ancestors. Now it actually seems to be a misprint in the shot of Okoye, but it is what it reads later when Shuri enters the ancestral plane version of this room when it transforms into literal sacred ground where Shuri finds the wisdom, albeit complex wisdom, of her ancestors. Ramonda is reminded that Okoye raised her spear against her own husband, referring to Wakabi, Daniel Kaluuya's character from the 2018 film who does not appear in this movie, but Ramonda says that Wakabi is somewhere that Okoye can visit him anytime she wishes, so this establishes that Wakabi is alive and well somewhere. Ramonda shouts, I am queen of the most powerful nation in the world, and my entire family is gone. Burn everything! God 
damn, what a great actress. Like Wanda, for the mothers of the MCU, with great power comes great loss. Ramona also snaps at Okoye for standing at Killmonger's side when she and Shuri had to flee to the mountains. Something I was surprised to hear she still held a grudge over, but it's all coming out and it hurts. Okoye resigns her spear. Ramona finds Nakia in an orphanage in Haiti, and we catch a quick glimpse of a boy who later gets revealed in the post-credit scene, Toussaint, played by young actor Divine Love Kanadu's son, and the post-credit scene is revealed as T'Challa in Nakia's son, T'Challa, son of T'Challa. That's the familiar greeting between the boy and his grandmother. Shuri and Riri wake up in a glowworm cavern, which we later learn is 140 meters below. Kind of a middle ground man cave for Namor to be alone and to paint, because yeah, you can't paint underwater. Shuri is told to put on a traditional Talokan dress. Riri says it's some supervillain shit, like Princess Leia, referring to the slave Leia bikini in Return of the Jedi, Belle from Beauty and the Beast, and she says that white chick from Indiana Jones, referring to when Marion had to put on the white dress in Raiders of the Lost Ark. But Belle from Beauty and the Beast, there wasn't anything that messed up about that. I mean, I guess it's kind of weird that a bunch of like clocks and candles and dishware is like, yeah, put on that sexy dress for that beast. This whole movie's kind of Stockholm Syndrome. Wakanda forever, tattoos for now. Inkbox tattoos last one to two weeks so you can express yourself with a tattoo for the mood that you are in right now without worrying about whether or not you'll want it, well, forever. There are over 10,000 tattoo designs to choose from. You can even create your own totally unique tattoo easily using Inkbox's custom platform. And if you're a pro artist or an avid doodler, you can draw your own tattoo with one of Inkbox's freehand tattoo markers. So they come in these little packets here. And the one that I want to try is this adorable boo-boo ghost tattoo. Ghosts are rad. I just really like the design. And I'm gonna put it like right here on my wrist. I think that's a good spot for it. So they give you this primer wipe, you wipe the area. Wipe, 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 wipe. It is nice and dry and primed, as they say. Feeling it and placing it. Okay, it's now in my hand and I'm just gonna let this sit. We're gonna let some time pass and then check back in later after it's fully developed because it takes about 24 hours for a dark blue or black color depending on what your skin is. Okay, some time has passed and uh, check it out. I have ghostly, ghostly pale skin. So it's, you know, it's like a dark blue. See, unlike other temporary tattoos, Inkbox's ink sinks into the top layer of your skin. And then after a week or two, it fades as your skin naturally regenerates. The ink is plant-based, cruelty-free and water resistant. And here we are. I've been ghosted in the good way. Inkbox's tattoos are perfect for switching up your style, testing out your next tattoo idea and make for unique gifts for the upcoming holiday. Right now, you can use the code new rockstars to get 25 percent off your entire Inkbox order. And there's no minimum order requirement, but you can only use it once, so stock up. The code will only be good until the end of 2022. To get started with Inkbox, just click the link in the description to start browsing. Nakia searches a village in the Yucatan in Mexico, speaking Spanish, which shows up as white subtitles, but the moment she switches to ancient Mayan, the language of Talokan, the subtitles switch to the color blue. Namor brings Shuri into his painting room, where he explains his backstory with his mother in 1571 in Zama, which was the original name of Tulum, which is one of the best preserved Mayan cities on the coastal Yucatan. Spanish conquistadores gave them smallpox. Now, 1571, this would be about 50 years after the Eternals witnessed the Spanish conquering of the Aztec capital and then parted ways. You could argue, had they finished the job, we might not have gotten Namor. Namor says they prayed to Chak their god of rain and abundance for a cure. Now, Chak is the Mayan rain deity, but in Aztec mythology, that god is named Tlaloc, who rules over Tlalocan. Namor says Chak led them to a plant underwater, sprouting from a vibranium rock. There, heart-shaped herb, but an herb that grows underwater. Namor's mother ingests this plant along with the rest of the tribe, and they wake up with blue skin, gasping for air, having to dive into the water so they can breathe, where their skin turns back a normal color. So other than Namor, the Tlaloc and Eel turn blue only when they are out of water. We see the birth of Namor as he's born in in underwater. He is the first son of Tzalokan with wings on his feet and ears that he says were pointed to the sky. And he calls himself a mutant. He says that he has the ability to age slowly and breathe both through air and through water. In the MCU, we're still gathering what the rules of mutant kind are, but it seems like every mutant must have some kind of genetic precondition that leads to their physical states turning out different from everyone else. But it also presents the question, do all mutants age slowly? Because according to the latter Fox X-Men films, that definitely seemed to be the case. To fulfill his mother's dying wish, young Namor returns to the land where he finds a slave plantation and a priest says, thou art a demon, son of Satan. Not yet, Padre, but uh, Mephisto's coming soon. The Talokaneo burned the plantation and Namor reveals the origin of his given name that they called him El Nino Sin Namor, the boy without love, which he embraced as Namor because he has no love for the surface world. So Namor wasn't just to know Chuerta pronouncing it differently. They actually worked in a bit of Spanish wordplay to cast Namor as proudly without love for humans. Namor gives Shuri a deep sea diving suit to show her Talokan. And at first I wondered, wait, where did the Talokaneo 
Neil get these until he realized, oh, right, yeah, Salazar and Jackson. Sure, he's wearing a suit that a diver was just murdered in. Nice, have fun, hope it doesn't smell bad. So Namora takes Shuri down through this tunnel in the water, which seems to be a kind of current, but I don't know, maybe it's a type of waypoint to a hidden earthly realm. Kind of like that watery portal that leads to Talo and Shang-Chi. Now, I know China and Mexico are different countries with completely different cultures and histories, but I'm just saying, Talo, Talo Khan, both of them hidden mythological realms on Earth? There might be a connection there. The amazing music of Buddha Kush and Ludwig Göransson's Kon La Brisa guides us into Talo Khan, which is revealed from Mayan script translating to English, the way other location titles translate from Wakandan to English. The Talo Khanil played the Mesoamerican ball game, Pizza. The modern version known as Ulama. This was played by Mayan peoples where a rubber ball is bounced from your hip through a hoop on the wall. You might know it as I did from the road to El Dorado. The Talocanil greet Namor with a salute, forming their hands kind of in the shape of a throne, but also an open shark mouth as the Talocan throne is a giant shark jawbone. Talocan, con, con. I regret that joke immediately. Namor shows Shuri his central palace that is made fully of vibranium and is lit by a powerful light his own golden city that he must protect. Nakia waits on a Yucatan beach for Griot to track Shuri's earrings and then dives into a water hole in the jungle, a land-based waypoint to Talokan. Now notice how Nakia's suit is green, the color of her river tribe, but costume designer Ruth E. Carter incorporated blue to look like a river snaking through the jungle, effectively telling the story of Nakia's rescue plot in the second act. Namor gives Shuri a bracelet of friendship, the same bracelet worn by his mother, both an olive branch, but we later learn the plant DNA that Shuri can use to resynthesize the heart shaped herb. So just to track the jewelry swapping going on in this movie, Shuri leaves her Kamoyo bead bracelet for Ross to find. Technically Val bugged that bracelet, but she keeps her earrings, which is how they track her down. Meanwhile, Namor notices that Shuri's wrist is bare as she surrenders herself to him, which she knows that he won't see as suspicious because she was not wearing that bracelet earlier at the Riverside fire ritual per her mother's request. So Namor gives her a bracelet, which becomes the cure that she has been seeking throughout this whole film. I love it when costumes and accessories have a practical and symbolic function in a film. Shuri tells Namor that T'Challa suffered in silence, and when he finally asked for help, she couldn't. Now, this is a nod to Chadwick Boseman in real life, who was diagnosed with colon cancer in 2016, and he told pretty much no one. He suffered in silence while shooting Black Panther and Infinity War and Endgame. Ryan Coogler recently told ta Coates in a podcast that he noticed Boseman would struggle during the Warrior Falls scenes in the 2018 film, and at the time, Coogler didn't really know why. Some days when I would find him doing things that were kind of inexplicable, like we would do these, these, these things in the water, you know, the waterfall stuff, so it would take him like a long time to, to warm back up. Like he had to be in like in a warming tent for like a long time. And I'd be like, I'd be like, man, that's, I'd be like, that's odd. You know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? Things like that, or, or you know, some, some days, I was finding just like incredibly sad. But looking back, I'm like, oh man, my man's was dying. It's a shocking thing to, to realize. And it's also a thing where it's like, oh yeah, I can't quit. If he if he did all of that while he was going through that, you know, this is just grief. So it's like, yeah, we gotta push through. Namor tells Shuri, my ancestors would often say only the most broken people can be great leaders. He's trying to appeal to her grief as a kind of compliment of wisdom, but Namor reveals the whole point of all this is that he plans to attack the surface world preemptively, and he wants Shuri to get Wakanda to join them in that war. And while he seems crazy, the scene we cut to confirms that to be essentially the case. The Secretary of State tells Val and Ross that the President plans to invade Wakanda. Namor meets Ramonda on a beach and warns her that he will kill her if any further intrusions happen to Talo Khan. Meanwhile, Nakia arrives and hits Shuri and Riri's telekineo guard with a face blast. Shuri reunites with her mother. Namor returns to find that dying guard, and Namora goats him to strike back. So Namor descends to his shark bone throne, where it looks like the teeth are actually made of vibranium. He wears a feathered serpent headpiece of Kuku Khan. I like the symbolic contrast in the directional coronation of the two kingdoms. Wakanda's ruler rises up from the ancestral plane to sit the throne. Talo Khan's ruler descends down from the sun to sit that throne. Talo Khan angrily rallies his people to war. Nakia reunites with Okoye in Wakanda. Okoye says that Nakia left right after Thanos' attack. When you left without saying a word, it hurt. I regret not being there with all of you. It was not easy. He was king and Black Panther to everyone. But to me... This means that Nakia was pregnant with T'Challa's son at the time of Thanos' snap in the Battle of Wakanda. And notice how here, Nakia catches herself. She almost says T'Challa was also the father to her son, but she just says that he was everything, which she was. 
Behind Nakia, water just slowly starts to flood into the street. We don't even notice it at first. Okoye just begins to say we are under attack, but then the water bombs explode throughout the streets. Now, Namor flooding Wakanda was a plot point in 2012 Avengers vs. X-Men comic storyline. That's when the Phoenix Force possesses Namor and uses him to flood Wakanda when the nation harbors Avengers. Namor and T'Challa have a bitter hatred for each other ever since that in the comics. Okoye grabs a kid as the water gushes and hands him off. Ao and the other Dormelage save some rescue workers who get enchanted by the Telekineal Siren song. Shuri and Aneka pilot an aircraft to save a trolley. We actually saw one of these on the streets in the 2018 film. It's just pretty satisfying to see all levels of Wakandans immediately springing to help each other. Namor joins Atuma and Namora on the shoreline, and M'Baku jumps him from behind but breaks his staff on his arm, and Namor punches him right in the chest, breaking his chest armor. Ryan Coogler said that Namor is as strong as Thor, and if he's around enough water, is as strong as Hulk. I actually recently broke down the power hierarchy in the MCU, and since Namor is technically the avatar of a god, that kind of checks out with the MCU's internal logic. Namor zigzags through the air defenses. He does his mid-air turn with his foot passing the camera, showing his ankle wings flapping over time. Namor flies up to the throne room to face off with Ramonda and Riri inside. He stabs his spear into the glass and cracks it, then throws water grenades and floods the room. Ramonda is able to save Riri, but she drowns, and Shuri is inconsolable. So Shuri has to go through another royal burial, this time for her mother. Now, ironically, by not burning her funeral garments before, she left them to be used again. Just imagine how horrible it is. You just wore clothes for your your brother's funeral, and before they even have a chance to gather dust, you gotta put them back on for your mother. Yet the answer to Shuri's woes is literally tattooed on her hand. The double helix configuration with orbs, her attempt at the recipe for the heart-shaped herb. And now on that same wrist is the final ingredient she needs, Namor's mother's bracelet that is made from that plant. Meanwhile, Val confronts her ex-husband Ross on his contact with Wakanda. Anderson Cooper cameos again, but this time the new sticker reads, Ritson signed trade pact with new Asgard to create something. But this is a nod to the new US President Ritson, who's gonna be played by Dermot Mulroney in Secret Invasion. So again, we're getting a sense of the political hierarchy. US President Ritson, Secretary of State Toby Ziegler, and CIA Director Val. It's still crazy to wrap my head around that. Also, this is a reminder that like Wakanda, the colony of new Asgard, led by King Valkyrie, is in the MCU its own nation state with international relations across the world stage. Now, Ross reminds us that the Wakandans could be using their vibranium against the United States and asks Val if she's ever thought what the US would be doing if we were the only country in the world who had vibranium. And Val's response is interesting. She says, oh, I actually dream about that. I think it's a little hint that one of Val's objectives is to amass all the vibranium and weaponry under government control, or at least under her control. And maybe the mission she's gonna deploy the Thunderbolts on is an invasion of or a heist from Wakanda. Or since Bucky's leading that team, maybe a collaboration with the Dora Milaje to steal back vibranium from some other third party who steals it, like the real intelligence here. So the Golden City evacuates to the Jabari outpost. Shuri and Riri deduce that Namor absorbs oxygen through his skin and thus will be weakened by dehydration. Riri gets to work on new iron art armor made from vibranium. She hammers out a piece in the shape of a heart. Shuri gives Okoye her completed Midnight Angel suit. In the comics, the Midnight Angels are Aneka's group of former Jormelage. Shuri is able to synthesize the heart-shaped herb DNA from the bracelet, and when it prints, it successfully glows. So Shuri sips the liquid and falls into the ancestral plane as Nakia Kia and Okoye pray for her. Now, structurally, this mirrors the leap of faith at the end of Act 2 in the 2018 film when the women resurrected T'Challa to restore Wakanda's protector. Shuri immediately finds herself in an ancestral plane mirror of the real world, underwater in the flooded throne room, in the exact same spot where her mother, Ramonda's life, left her body. Just like how when Killmonger went to the ancestral plane, he visited the exact spot of his parents' tragic death. Shuri swims up to the surface, and she's again wearing her white funeral garments, but as she rises out of the water, her clothes are dry. A really cool effect that makes me wonder if Letitia Wright and Ryan Coogler might have shot this in reverse. But here in the throne room, we see there is someone sitting on the throne behind her. Suddenly, we all feel a mix of dread because none of us want to see a CGI recreation of Chadwick Boseman. It can't be him. It can't be. So instead, the ghost who greets us is Killmonger, Michael B. Jordan, making a surprise cameo, which comes as both a relief, but also an intriguing haunting of its own. The scene that follows is my favorite scene of the film, cutting deep to the core conflict of this film while also recontextualizing everything we saw in the 2018 film. Remember, the ancestral plane is not an objective afterlife. It's really a personalized vision where the visitor is able to confront their ancestors. There's some cosmic forces at play that decide who you actually need to talk to. One could say this is a request coming from one's own soul. But for T'Challa, it was to rage against his father for killing Njoku 
Nobu and abandoning Njaka. For Killmonger, it was his chance to revisit the Oakland apartment where his father died. But who does Shuri see? She sees her cousin, Killmonger, who taunts her, saying, you chose me. And he challenges her for not even believing the ancestral plane was real, but just took the herb for the same reason he did to avenge fallen ancestors. Now remember, as much as this is Killmonger talking to her, we could totally look at this as Shuri having a conversation with herself and all the second guessing she's been doing about Killmonger over the past several years. So why did Shuri see Killmonger? She already chose him earlier in the film when she said at that Riverside campfire that she wanted to burn the world down. That was Killmonger's goal. And notice how in this scene, the throne room ignites the same way Killmonger set the heart-shaped herb garden ablaze and left Shuri with that medical crisis. Here, Killmonger defends himself. He says, I had the courage to do what was necessary to change Wakanda. How many people like your scientists did Wakanda protect before I took the throne? Cowards, those are the Panthers who came before me and before T'Challa. Shuri tells Killmonger that he was a coward for taking the last herb and burning the rest out of fear of being replaced, that he left Wakanda with no protector and that T'Challa and Ramona's blood is on his hands. But Killmonger responds, don't you dare take that away from your mother. She sacrificed her life to protect a girl from the lost tribe. Your father, he was a hypocrite. He would have killed that girl. Shit, he killed his own brother. T'Challa, he was too noble. He let a man who killed your father live. And here you stand. Are you gonna be noble like your brother or take care of business like me? Killmonger calls Riri a member of the lost tribe, which is how he saw himself and all other black people outside of Wakanda, the lives that he fought for. Killmonger also invokes Zemo, who killed T'Chaka, and T'Challa forgave Zemo at the end of Civil War. I like to think that Zemo, at this moment, stiffened in his cell on the raft, feeling a shiver down his spine, but then just resumed dancing. It's so, so interesting to see Killmonger eternally sitting on the throne. Now again, Shuri has subconsciously summoned him here, but this visual presents a hypothetical that Killmonger could be in a kind of hell of his own making, where he's sitting on the throne that he always wanted, but ruling over a vacant dead kingdom, while all other panther ancestors join together in a communion as panthers in a tree. Killmonger, tragically, will always be part of a lost tribe of one. This scene ends before Shuri can even answer Killmonger's question, framing it as a haunting nightmare that she's still trying to figure out for the rest of the film. She's afraid to tell others who she saw in that vision out of shame, because Killmonger was a symptom of her own moral illness that this physician still needs to heal. But Shuri still has super strength, and she suits up in a new suit. She places her helmet beside the helmet of her brother, the helmet that she carried in the opening funeral scenes. Now she has a helmet of her own, and Shuri joins everyone else at the Jabari outpost, fully suited up. Interesting how she joins by descending from above, the way Namor sat his throne. Shuri does not rise up, she drops down. She's still being driven by the misguided vengeance that guides Namor and guided Killmonger. When she lands, I like how the impact spreads via purple kinetic energy as her suit absorbs the shock of it. Her helmet has a dot pattern that matches the war paint that she's worn from past battles. Also on her gauntlets are open panther maws. Shuri leads the Wakandans out to the ocean and lures the Talakonil into battle. She chants, Ibon Bay! That was T'Challa's war cry from the Battle of Wakanda and Infinity War. Since Namor's punch broke his old chest plate, M'Baku suits up with new armor, bearing the face of Hanuman. That's the ape deity of the Jabari worship. The Talakonil attack from the backs of blue whales and orcas. Their shields are pretty sure the shells of sea turtles. Awesome! Namora breaks the pulsing device that the Wakandans use to try to subdue them. Actually, Jessica Clemens interviewed Alex Livinali and Mabel Cadena, asking about their underwater work for this film, and Alex confirmed that Mabel holds the record. But she's the champ. Are at, you? At holding <laughs> How the long? breath. How long? Please. Six minutes and a half. No. Yeah. No, no, you, you, gotta, you gotta say that loud. <laughs> Six minutes, you can hold your breath underwater. Six yeah. minutes and a half! Uh, you're a fish. <laughs> Riri joins the fight in her Mark II armor. It's got an inner heads-up display of her head in darkness, surrounded by glowing indicators, much like Iron Man's heads-up display. One of her controls reads max power. I like how she also installs some foot thrusters, similar to Tony's Mark 50 armor in Infinity War. Riri shoots at Namor from behind, but he's able to dodge the blast without looking. Crazy good reflexes! They're able to snare Namor on the Royal Talon Fighter. Shuri uses hand-mounted sonic cannons to repel the telekinetic like the ones that she used on Killmonger in the 2018 film, she claws down the side of the boat, kicking one Talakanil, throwing another, barrel rolling, and then sliding down. Since both her claws and the hull of this boat are made of vibranium, they release blue sparks from the friction. And from here, she leaps into the Royal Talon Fighter, where she tries to fly Namor to a nearby desert to finish him off. But before they get there, he's able to use his spear to stab through the fighter and wreck the engine, causing it to crash, leading to this brutal showdown. The claws come out. Shuri and Namor slug it out. She dodges his hook and goes low, slicing off some of his ankle wings. He impales her on his spear. And since it's pure vibranium, it goes through her suit's vibranium weave. It seems like it's all over. As her life fades, she's transported back to the ancestral plane, the burning throne room briefly. Her greatest fear, that being consumed with Killmonger's vengeful rage, has led her to death. But instead, she now rejects that path. 
she claws off the spear, she pulls herself off of it, somehow leaving no blood on the shaft of that spear, okay, and leaps over Namor and lands before him. And she uses the exploding jet engine to blast Namor, presumably most effective just by drying him out even further. And as she holds a blade to his throat, both fighters are close to death and they sink in this fascinating interlocking visions of their ancestors. For Shuri, the conflicts of the past rewind. We see the flooding and the battles before reversing, symbolizing her wounds beginning to heal, both the physical wounds in her suit and her psychological illness. Her mind is retracing its steps back to the mutually peaceful kingdoms of Wakanda and Talokan. And finally, Shuri sees the ancestors she wanted to see in the ancestral plane, a vision of her mother, Ramonda, who says, show him who you are. And Shuri tells Namor to yield so that their kingdoms can protect each other. Namor looks up at Shuri and what does he see? He sees the vision of his mother reaching down to him. On this sacred ground, these two have found the wisdom of their ancestors. A closing montage shows Shuri replanting the heart-shaped herb garden in T'Challa's gravesite. She greets Riri in the lab and makes her return the suit, but leaves her with the car of her father that Okoye wrecked on the bridge earlier. Not having this super vibranium suit is probably a good idea because this way Riri is going to be set up to build a new DIY armor set in Ironheart on Disney Plus in 2023. We return to Warrior Falls, but instead of Shuri coming out of the Royal Talon Fighter, it's M'Baku. He says that Black Panther Shuri sends her regards, but M'Baku wishes to challenge for the throne. This sets up M'Baku to be the new ruler of Wakanda, while Shuri continues to be Black Panther, at least an intermediary one. We catch up back with Namor and Namora in his painting cave. It seems as though things are still a bit unresolved, and we realize Namor has been painting all this time a depiction of himself and a panther locked in battle. Okoye rescues Ross from captivity, making him a fugitive from the American government, and leaving Okoye in her Midnight Angel suit, finally with some headgear that she's comfortable in. The final scene brings Shuri to a beach in Haiti, where she finally allows herself to burn her funeral garments. She closes her eyes and meditates, and she flashes back to the images of T'Challa from the 2018 film, when he walked down the hallway to her lab and gave his sister their handshake, when she placed his necklace suit on him after he resurrected, the first time he walked into the throne room as king, as she finally breathes to let go of her brother, she and we are lulled by Rihanna's Lift Me Up, the lyrics of which become Shuri's prayer to her brother. Lift me up, hold me down, hold me close safe and sound. Now, burning in a hopeless dream echoes the fire of the despair that she felt in her nightmare with Killmonger. In the second verse, that part becomes drowning in an endless sea, a contrast to fire and water there. But both represent Killmonger and Namor dragging Shuri down into violence, which is why the chorus comes back to the prayer of lift me up. And in the post credit scene, her prayers are answered. Nakia introduces Shuri to her nephew, Toussaint. Shuri says the name Toussaint carries a history, referring to Toussaint L'Overture. Sorry if I mispronounced that, my French sucks. But this guy was awesome, called the Black Napoleon the father of Haiti, who in 1791 led a successful slave revolt against the French and won Haitian independence. I think what I love most about this line is that it signals Shuri has, through her Wakandan outreach centers that she built with T'Challa, has begun to learn more Black history from outside Wakanda and has begun to reconnect with that lost tribe that Killmonger fought for. I mean, I don't know. Shuri's pretty smart. Maybe she already knew this stuff, but it did seem like in the 2018 film, all she really seemed to know about the outside world was like Disneyland and Back to the Future 2. Toussaint reveals that his real name is T'Challa, son of King T'Challa. He would be no more than six or seven years old, so we would need a bit of a time jump before we see any real superhero action from this kid, even if he were to join a group like the Young Avengers, but a new T'Challa lives. He has his whole life ahead of him, and he knows where he comes from and who his Baba was. The Black Panther is not a burden Shuri must carry alone anymore. Her brother is gone, but Wakanda is forever. Now definitely go watch Jessica Clement's thoughtful review of Wakanda Forever that's on the channel, along with MT's insightful breakdown of the post credit scene. I truly appreciate you all giving me this opportunity to break down this powerful film, and to bring my nerdy analysis to this artistic achievement of Ryan Coogler and his whole team as Marvel Phase 4 comes to a close. Now, as we look ahead to Phase 5, stay tuned for some big announcements about some new projects where you will be able to see me dive even deeper into the details you missed from the films you love. There's some big things ahead for new rock stars in 2023. I can't wait to share them with you. Follow me on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter at EA Voss. Follow new rock stars. Subscribe to new rock stars for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching. Bye.